This is Ray Grossworth. Welcome to my documentary entitled The Red Danube. A few months ago, when I initially decided to do a documentary, it had nothing to do with the Red Danube. I set out to tell a story about my late maternal grandfather, Henry Grossworth. He lived a very long life, dying at age 96 in 1975. He was born in Austria in 1879, which was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire back then. I'll be showing you a map just to give you an idea of how large the Austro-Hungarian Empire actually was. The empire lasted from around the 1860s through World War I. For Austro-Hungarian Jews, life was a mixed bag. Austro-Hungarian Jews were allowed to pursue many fields yet they had many restrictions at the same time. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed following World War I, there was a brief period where Jews were allowed to experience more freedom as the Austro-Hungarian Empire was divided amongst many countries. My grandfather and his family managed to migrate from Austria to Hungary, which was now a separate country following World War I. When my grandfather came to America, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was still intact. For his family members who stayed behind, they went through several very difficult periods. There was the period of uncertainty following World War I, which eventually gave way to Nazi-occupied Hungary during World War II, and shortly following World War II, there was a communist takeover of Hungary. The title of this documentary, The Red Danube, pertains to a terrible day in 1944 where Jews were either sent to Auschwitz or Many were shot along the banks of the Danube River, thus turning the water from blue to red. In order to fully understand the full history of my late grandfather's family, it's important to begin with a map of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As you can see, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was huge. My grandfather was born in Austria, but eventually his family migrated to the right and settled in the areas of Hungary. A very profound thought that goes through my head on occasion is the fact that if my grandfather had not come to America from Hungary, I would not be here today to make this documentary. My grandfather was fairly quiet about his Hungarian ancestry and this is understandable. He was obviously aware of the pain and suffering inflicted upon family members who stayed behind and I'm sure this was very uncomfortable for him to think about and it's for this reason that he never talked openly about his ancestry 
or family members that were left behind in Hungary. When one does family research, it's always helpful to look at cemetery records. Unfortunately, when we're talking about the Austro-Hungarian Empire, very few cemetery records still exist. After the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dissolved after World War I, countries comprising the empire were divided among several other countries including Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other Slovakian nations, Austria, and Hungary. To make matters worse, when the Nazis invaded Hungary during World War II, they not only exterminated as many Hungarian Jews as they could find, but they also destroyed cemeteries in the process. So when I decided to take upon the project of researching my family history, it was quite an undertaking, considering the fact that I could not rely upon cemetery records to get my information. It will be helpful now to begin with the history of my grandfather, tracing his trips from Hungary to the United States. There were actually two trips. And after I do this, I will go back and look at the period of World War II. And as I do this, you'll see why this documentary is called The Red Danube. Pictured here is my great-grandfather, Sigmund Grosworth. He was married to Yetta Eiglander. And from what we know, Sigmund's sibling names were Rose, Samuel, Abraham, Jacob, William, Nathan, Ferdinand, Simon, Lazar, and Menachem. To the best of my knowledge, uh, most of the siblings, in addition to Sigmund, remained in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, according to my grandfather's U.S. Certificate of Naturalization, he was naturalized by the Supreme Court of Monroe County at Rochester, New York, on September 30th, 1913. And in the next photo, you will see a picture of my grandfather, Henry Grossworth, and my grandmother, Sally Wicks. They were married on March 13, 1904, in Hungary. And they arrived in the United States together on June 12, 1907. As I'm going through paperwork that does exist on my grandfather, I continue to be amazed by his story. It was surprising for me to learn, for example, that he spoke six languages when he was only 13 years old. He traveled to America from Austria the first time in 1896. 
He worked at many professions, both here and in Austria, and then again in Hungary, before finally settling here. His first job in America was in a cigar factory. He then injured his hand and found it necessary to return to Austria to have his hand fixed. And while in Austria, he tried his hand at cabinet making. After making a mistake on one of the products that he manufactured, he was severely beaten by his boss. Yes, that's how some workers were treated back then. When he fetched his wife, Sally Wicks, in Hungary to bring her back to America, he initially worked at uh, Stein Bakery in Rochester, but eventually he found himself at Kodak. He started working there in 1910 and retired in 1944. When he was interviewed about his life and career at Kodak for Kodak's newspaper, which was called uh, the Kodakery, he didn't really lament the fact that by speaking six languages he could have perhaps pursued other fields, but he was very proud of his uh, manufacturing career at Kodak. My father followed in his footsteps and worked at Kodak for 35 years. I had an opportunity to work at Kodak since I had a summer job there while going to college, but I chose to pursue other areas. In tribute to my grandfather, I want to talk to you now about his family. Not all of his family, some did make it here to America, but I want to speak in general about his family members who elected to stay behind in Eastern Europe, most notably in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and later in Nazi-occupied Hungary. While not all of their individual fates are known, Yad Vashem did supply me with information on members of the Grossworth family who perished during the terrible days of the Holocaust. At present, I can report that 82 people with the last name of Grossworth perished during the Holocaust years, and many of these individuals perished in Hungary during the final year of the war in 1944. You are now looking at three photos I found of gravestones belonging to members of my extended family. These tombstones were located in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. As I indicated earlier, if you are taking on similar research on your family members who might have lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you are going to run into obstacles. Very few of the cemeteries remain because uh, they were largely destroyed 
during the period of the two world wars. I'm now going to show you two photos of scenic Budapest. What stands out in these photos is the beautiful Blue Danube River. However, in 1944, the Blue Danube was to turn red. In 1944, Germany finally began to face the reality that they were about to lose the Second World War. Nevertheless, out of desperation perhaps, they decided to exterminate as many of the remaining Jews as possible. Many of these Jews lived in Hungary. Sadly, the Nazis were aided by members of the Hungarian police and military. And what was about to occur was indeed horrific. Hungarians who were not rounded up and sent to Auschwitz were shot along the banks of the Danube River, thus turning it red. First is uh, two cities and in the middle is the so-called blue Danube, for me it is the red Danube, but that's what it was. And they took people down there, the Hungarian Nazis, and they roped three people together and they shot the middle one, so they all fell in. And if they saw a movement, they shot again so they'd be sure. But many people by themselves somehow got out. But it was a terribly cold winter, as I said, and the Danube was frozen with big slabs of ice. So Raoul came home the third night and there was no moonlight, no stars just cold and dark and he turned to us the first time usually only talked to the man and the red cross how many of you can swim i have a big mouse i put up my hand i said best swimmer in school he says let's go and as you saw me coming in like a teddy bear that's how i was dressed and a hat and a glove and we went down on the other side the hungarians didn't even hear us coming because they were so busy roping and shooting and we stood on the left way over. We had doctors and nurses in the cars and then we had people outside to pull us out. Four of us, three men and me, we jumped. And thanks to the ice, it was the, the, the ropes hung on to it and we saved people out, but only 50. And then we were so frozen that we couldn't do Whenever I look through family photos, I always give thanks to my grandparents, Henry and Sally Grossworth, for making a decision to come to America from Hungary. After all, if they had not done so, I would not be here today to do this documentary. Henry and Sally raised several children who in turn raised their own families. The children of Henry and Sally and succeeding generations have produced over 100 Americans. 
Henry and Sally had their first child while living in Hungary. Her name was Celia, and sadly she died as an infant. When Henry and Sally came to America, they had a son named Jonas, and sadly he also died as a child. I am happy to report that the rest of their children lived long, happy lives and got to see their children raise families as well. So I am thankful to Henry and Sally for coming to America, just as I am thankful to my father and his siblings. So I want to take a moment to pay tribute to my Aunt Minna, my Aunt Selma, my Aunt Regina, my Uncle Edward, my Uncle Louis, and my father Sidney. For all they did to honor the legacy of their parents, Henry and Sally. There are two movies I'd like to recommend to you that tie into the Hungarian history I have been talking about. One is entitled Good Evening Mr. Wallenberg. It's the story of Swedish businessman Raoul Wallenberg who helped Jews in Budapest in 1944 obtain Swedish passports to get out of Adolf Eichmann's deadly path. It's estimated that Raoul Wallenberg saved over 60,000 Jews. A fictional story that I recommend is called Sunshine with an all-star cast headlined by Ray Fiennes. It tells the story of three generations of a Hungarian family who lived through the various periods I have been talking about, namely the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Nazi-occupied Hungary, and communist-dominated Hungary. It's a powerful story and I highly recommend it. By telling the story of what occurred in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and later in Hungary, either through a documentary like this or through a dramatic motion picture, we can conjure up images of what occurred, but nothing equals what was actually witnessed and experienced by those who were there. I had intended to include a story of Dr. Joseph Mengele in this documentary. However, there is enough information out there for you to do your own research. He was often labeled as the angel of death. And whether Jews were from Hungary or other parts of Eastern Europe, they often related stories of seeing him upon their arrival at Auschwitz. He was often seen standing along the railroad tracks as the train arrived, and with the simple gesture of a hand, he would make a sole determination who was to live and who was to die. When it was rumored that he was still alive in 1985, there was an international search for him. The United States even put up a two and a half million dollar reward for information leading to his arrest. However, however, after all this searching, it was determined that Mengele 
had died in 1975 in Brazil. So when we research the Holocaust, it's important to look at both the heroes and the villains of World War II to develop a full understanding of how good and evil plays in horrific events throughout history. In the process of my narration, I gave you some information about my grandfather and his extended family, but it's also important to state that my grandmother, Sally Wicks-Grosworth, also came from a very large family. She was the daughter of Jonas and Celia Wicks, and her siblings were Louis, Jacob, Arnold, Regina, Lena, Joseph, and Adolf. My grandmother, Sally, died when I was only five years old. I do remember her as a very kind woman who always had cookies for me when I came over to visit. But she was also a trailblazer for the time period she lived. She ventured into areas that were often closed to women in the early part of the 20th century. She was actually one of the first women in Rochester to venture into real estate and she also distinguished herself as a civic leader and was active for many years in local women's groups. For example, she was affiliated with the Golden Link of the Order of the Golden Chain. And uh, one of the things this group did was raise four million dollars for the war bond effort. And the Order of the Golden Chain also worked tirelessly on behalf of uh, disadvantaged children. Perhaps most noteworthy, uh, my grandmother was president of the Sisterhood of the Congregation of B'nai Israel for more than 13 years. Considering that she did sell real estate in the early part of the 20th century, I guess she really was quite a trailblazer. Over the course of many decades, scholars have tried to come up with reasons for the Holocaust. Some have even tried to go as far as psychoanalyzing Adolf Hitler to see what drove him. One interesting th theory that has generated a lot of support is the simple fact that Adolf Hitler, as a young man, had aspirations toward becoming an artist. The theory goes that one of his early professors, a Jewish man, severely criticized Hitler's art. And this might have been the springboard that led to his anti-Semitic views. Whether or not this is the actual case is simply a matter of conjecture. There is no evidence to suggest that Hitler's parents may have instilled in him early anti-Semitism that would fuel the Holocaust many years later. You get some glimpses into how his mind worked if you were to read Mein Kampf. But we'll never know for certain what drove the madman to accomplish what he set out to do. Concerning the collective consciousness of German officers who oversaw the atrocities at concentration camps, again, this is a difficult undertaking. 
Some officers would say that they were simply following orders from above. Others seem to have had no conscience about what they did. If you look at photos of some of the officers who oversaw the atrocities, you can see how they went about overseeing the killing machine during the periods of the Holocaust and then going home and living as everyday fathers without a second thought about what they did in the course of their day at concentration camps. You can even see photos of them engaging in partying and having a grand old time in the face of what they were doing. So if you are researching psychoanalytical efforts that have been done to analyze either Adolf Hitler or the officers who served him, you may or may not come up with concrete answers. At best, those of us who research the Holocaust and present the evidence for you to see, all we can hope for is that the lessons of the past can be learned in such a way that atrocities are not repeated again. There have also been troubling theological issues as a result of the Holocaust. Many continue to ask the question, where was God in the midst of all this suffering? Some saw God amongst those who were indeed suffering, and some saw God in the souls of those who were driven to be heroes. Again, there are questions that will probably never be answered. As I conclude, I echo the thoughts of many who either lived through the Holocaust or have researched it. In brief, let us hope that nothing of the magnitude of the Holocaust ever happens again.